I saw all that jazz, and I saw her dance, the aerorotica dance, and I said, that is a Valkyrie. If ever there's been a Valkyrie on Earth, it is that woman. That's a Valkyrie, and we must find who that woman is. I knew nothing about the movie. I knew nothing about the Conan comics. Um, I had no script. Uh, I went in there. It was basically a meeting. And John Milius, I remember, said, do you want to jump on the end of a tornado and go for a ride? He's probably the grandest storyteller of all times. So the hours that we spent together was him basically explaining the character and the story. John, to me, working with him for the, the months we were together, always made me laugh because the characters are the people. And he's looking for the person that is the person. And I think he goes, your face is right, your stature is right, your athletic ability is right. Who are you? I am Subutai, thief. An archer. I am Hakenian. We said this character should be like Jerry Lopez. And he was a very good friend of mine, my surfing buddy and everything, and never acted. And so we read some people. And I remember I read this one kid who was pretty good in some movie, and he read very well. And the agent wanted some ungodly amount of money for him. And so I said, the hell with that. And I read some other people that weren't good, and I said, well, everybody we want, we like him because they kind of remind you of Jerry Lopez. Why don't we just go get Jerry? He'll be able to do it. And, and so we did. And we tested Jerry, and he tested pretty well. And even Dino was quite surprised. Long before I first read the script, I had been a Robert E. Howard fan and had read most of the Conan books and, and you know, most of his uh, other stories as well. And when John said he was going to possibly do this project. We spent a lot of time together discussing all the stuff about the historical things that the characters were patterned after and stuff like that. For instance, my character in Conan Subatai was patterned after one of Genghis Khan's Mongol generals. So John Millis and I both did quite a bit of reading on the Mongols. Steel isn't strong, boy. Flesh is stronger. I really thought that it would be neat to make him look like a race that had disappeared, to have this great James Earl Jones face and then have these stark blue eyes, you know, and uh, straight hair so that he would really look like he was uh, part of a, a migration of, of a race that had died out, some superior kind of early Atlantean type of character. And in that way, he sort of played like he is the last of his race, you know, and that he knows more than them and everything, but his race is weakening and this other race is coming in. People tend to have fun with villains and it destroys the credibility. You take um, Phil Sadoom or, or Darth Vader, have fun with them, I think it's a big mistake. And, and, and what you must do, though, is hire somebody who is essentially a gentle human being, a bear like myself, you know, who, who I don't represent evil in, to, in the media, certainly, but, but uh, and then have me do those, that, that, that dialogue. They should all drown in lakes of blood. Now they will know why they are afraid of the dark. Now they will learn why they fear the night. The violence in Conan fits there's no gratuitous violence. There's no making fun of violence. To me, violence is really repugnant when it cheapens human life. One of the things that was very good about Conan as compared to other comic book characters is that Conan could be hurt. Conan was mortal, you know. Conan didn't come through these fights unscarred, either physically or mentally. Dolce Doom is in the movie only as that element that leads Arnold on his quest for revenge. And until Arnold gets underway, he is only focused on revenge. That's all he thinks about. He's not a hero until he goes beyond revenge to kill the evil force for the whole world. Then he becomes a hero. The idea was that was always going to give you a hint that this was going to be more than one movie. It should have been the beginning of the trilogy. The trilogy was, each one was, was about something. 
And the, the first one was about strength, raw strength. The second one was about responsibility. And the third one was about kind of tradition and loyalty. You know, where I was going was that ultimately there are things that people do things for that are, that are larger than them. John wanted Basil to do the score from the very beginning. And we had some discussions with uh, Dino and some of the other people about having uh, Ennio Morricone do it. And, but John insisted that it was something that Basil could do. From the time that I was set to write the music from Conan until I recorded it was probably a period of a year. At that point, before John went off to Spain to start shooting, he had requested that I you know, come up with several thematic concepts for the film. And th these aren't finished pieces of music by any stretch of the imagination. Sometimes they're no more than eight measures of music, a melody, a phrase. So he basically he had the f four, probably four major themes of the film, uh, which, he, which he took off when he started shooting. Conan, however, had some very serious requirements in that you're dealing with prehistory. John always envisioned this thing taking place 10,000 years before recorded history. So what does that mean musically? So we explored the concepts of, oh, we'll use antique instruments. But then we realized that isn't even far enough back. Medieval is, you know, fairly modern compared to Conan. He knew he wanted it to be operatic. There was no question in his mind that because there was so little dialogue, that the music really had to carry a lot of the story. The studio was very nervous because the movie was very violent. I mean, at the time we got an X three times before we finally got it to be an R-rated picture. In Vegas at the sneak preview, we showed up at the theater and like an hour and a half before the screening, there were lines around the block, you know, with all these guys and there were all these bikers in leather and chain and they were all waiting in line and there were more people than there were seats in the theater. So we pulled another movie from another theater and we showed the movie three times the same night. We had such a tremendous turnout that we had to bicycle the prints from, uh, from one theater to another. I remember the greatest thing was to go in the theater at that moment that I knew everyone would love, that moment where natural selection has selected him and he looks up from pushing the wheel of pain and it's Arnold People went nuts. We really knew when we showed that movie that we had a win on our hands. I became plugged in to a huge machinery, unlike anything that I ever expected in my career, that I would make such a big leap forward and that this could be my chance to step out of my past, the bodybuilding past, and step into the international arena of show business. I often think of the review in Time Magazine, which was very short, which called it Star Wars by a Psychopath. <laughs> they completely dismissed it, you know, it was just claptrap of sword and sorcery and that kind of thing. And yet, it does seem to have an effect on people. I think that I look at it as, in my thing, I look at everything as a battle, because I always wanted to be a general, I never wanted to be a director, you know. and. This was a large battle. This was a divisional sized battle. And it was very carefully designed, conceived of, and executed with great skill and valor. And the battle was won. This is shows. This is the show. Even when you work on a on a documentary about the making of Conan, there's injuries and danger involved. <laughs> it never stops.